my first two children are IVF babies. I'm very open about it. And through that process, and this is nearly 20 years ago, I never told my employer. That's just one example of the bigger picture of all these things that women are typically juggling and keeping under wraps because they're too fearful of being too emotional, too volatile, too ballsy. I want to be able to support women and retain them and engage them in the workplace. If you take a career break to have kids or even to take four or five years off, let's stop this judgment on people coming back in rather than writing women off because they've had kids. Women are paid 81 cents to every dollar globally versus men. Not good enough. More women graduate from university than men. And yet at the top of the triangle in the senior positions, we have more men. 1% of VC funding goes to female founders. And the year before was 2.4%. The whole funding world needs to just rethink this bias against women. We need man ambassadors, you know, men that are gonna really champion women because men tend to listen to men. So if a man says to another man, invest in Elizabeth, invest in Womo, this idea is brilliant, he's more likely to pay attention to that. Every employee is a walking PR machine. Mm -hmm. And you want them sat in the pub on a Friday night mm. saying, do you know what my company did this mm -hmm. week? It was so cool. You don't want them saying, my company are awful and they mm -hmm. treated me badly and they were rude and they disrespected me. What can organizations be doing to make the whole experience more positive, more engaging, more valuable, more connected? I'd love to think that there could be a board meeting going on and they say, Elizabeth's not here today. Really exciting, she's going through fertility treatment. She's out today, but back in next week. And for everyone to say, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Not, oh my gosh, why isn't she here? That's outrageous. Mm. You know, I wanna normalize all the human things that we go through in life as women. Mm -hmm. I have managed hundreds of maternity leaves across my career. And I've seen brilliant, incredible, amazing women have bad experiences from the behavior of a line manager. I can't do this anymore. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader, a video podcast that shows you that there are many faces of leadership, that perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist, and that making mistakes or taking detours can often lead to deep insights about your superpowers. My name is Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, and I help ambitious leaders hire the most in-demand, high-potential C-suite talent. Each week, let me take you on a journey to discover what leadership truly is and how you too can get to the very top. And in the meantime, help us reach 1000 subscribers, hit that red subscribe button below and the bell icon so you don't miss a single episode. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining. So good to see you. You are so welcome. I'm <laughs> thrilled to be here. And I love how you arrive on your bike. Every time I see you, you're like, you're so sporty and so active. And you're a person that I think is probably has the most energy of pr probably anyone that I have ever seen. And partly why I wanted to invite you onto the show is well, one, because you have an amazing HR career, having worked with some major luxury brands, I think LVMH, mm -hmm. was it Harvey Nichols? Am I yeah. right? Harvey yep. Nichols, yes, and uh, the Tapestry Group um, coach, and also have recently started your own business, which is an amazing cause, and I'd love to talk to you about that. But um, but before we get started on Womo, and I'd love for you to go into that in just a moment, but in terms of your superpowers, has there been a moment when you realized, that's it, this is this is what I'm really good at. And was there kind of this pivotal moment for you when recognizing that? Well, that's an interesting question, a pivotal moment. I think my career has been a real evolving of me as a person, along with growing in my skills as an HR leader. Um, and there were certainly pivotal moments. There are points at which I made shifts and changes to my career and made choices to the next step I went up to as I grew my career um, in HR. Um, and some of them were around, I think the pivotal changes were around alignment in what was right for me. And the point at which I felt potentially my values were compromised or I wasn't really feeling like authentically Elizabeth when I stepped into work every day, that's probably the point at which I questioned whether or not that job I was in was the right one for me. And then pivotal shifts happened 
in either how I did my job in that company or what I felt was right for me and moving into a different business. Can you talk about a moment when that happened when you, I, and I really love what you said about like, it didn't feel very Elizabeth. Like how, how did you know it wasn't that? And you know, what, what were the signs for you? If I think back to you, um, and I better not name the business, it would feel wrong to do that, <laughs> but a particular business where I felt the culture was quite oppressive to women. This is a few years back in my career. And the particular person I was working for was incredibly challenging. I got a new leader, was working for a man. I felt he was incredibly chauvinistic. And I was having to really compromise some deep values in what I felt I was as a person to be able to deliver what he wanted as my boss. And I tried to adapt my style of work to fit into it and got to the point of, I can't do this anymore. This isn't right for me. And so that was a real pivotal shift in terms of me looking to the next move in that business or outside of that business to get away from working for somebody who I didn't respect fundamentally. Mm. It's really hard, isn't it? Especially when someone's your boss and you're trying to, you know, you have your own beliefs and your own values and yet someone's trying to, to some extent, enforce something that you, you know, just sort of at odds with you and you're trying to please them. But at the same time, it's just, like, it doesn't feel authentic and mm. you can't move forward from that. And what did you do? How did you handle that? I looked for other opportunities within the organization and um, and there was a few options. Um, and then I had the opportunity of a, um, I was headhunted actually, and an, an alternative opportunity came up for me. And I did pursue that route, have the interviews and then moved into that particular role. Um, but I think just going back to that pivotal moment for me, if I look back now, and it's only as we talk about this, I think about it. One of my big passions that I've always had as an HR leader is around the whole culture of a business for engagement. And actually, can we have every employee come into work and be their authentic self? And probably as we discuss it, that's come from some of my own experiences of knowing that my passion, my commitment, my productivity was so depleted by working for somebody who didn't believe in the same values as me that how do we address that in a big organizational setting as an HR leader and say, we want to drive a culture of inclusion. And I followed a real passion of that through my career, which actually probably came from a lot of my own experiences. Mm. With regards to finding, you know, really knowing what your deep values are, have you always felt that you just always known or was there a point when you just realized that much more clearly? I think they've evolved and changed. Some of the things I think I felt were important to me in my 20s were definitely different in my 30s and then now in my 40s. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from, I'm a mom, you know, having children, different needs in my life, different demands, different priorities. Um, when I started out in my career, I've always loved working. I've loved my career. It was work, work, work. And then you have a child, as you well know, then children change your priorities. So I think my values have shifted along the way. But that real drive and purpose and passion I have innately inside me, which I've probably had from being a child of making a difference to people around me is still there. It's always been there. Mm. Why did you go into HR? That is a good question. <laughs> I did it by accident. And mm. actually, as I talk to more and more people in the HR space in my network, I learn that a lot of people go into HR by accident. Mm. <laughs> it's not necessarily a career that you think about at school or university. Um, so I came out of university in debt, as we all do, and needed to make some money. And I went to work for a recruitment company. And at that time, um, I was working, running a temp desk and the bonuses were good. And my eyes were on the prize of paying off my student debt. And that was my real focus and passion. I was like, get the debt paid down, you know, <laughs> come on. Yeah. Then we can have adventures and excitement and I can buy a car and fun things like that. And then the company I was working for got bought by another company and they created a shared, shared service HR department within this group of re recruitment companies and they advertised internally for an HR administrator. And I was like, 
oh, I'm done with sales. I'm going to try that. <laughs> Literally, it was like, mm. I'll give it a go. And I loved it. Mm. I loved learning about employment law. I loved the whole mentality around, yes, the legal parts, but wanting to be able to make changes in the business with people and then learning that legally you couldn't. And I questioned it. I was like, why? Why can't you do that? So I really got this interest in, you know, the legality side of it, but also how to drive a business from a commercial perspective when you have to factor in all this employment law along the way. I had no idea I'd have an interest in that, but I found it. Mm. And then once I found it, I was off on a mission of, right, you know, <laughs> HR is for me. This is what mm. I want to do. You made an amazing career from that too. Kind Thank of following, you. following your, your passion and interest in people and, you know, wanting to make things right. I mean, this is something that I feel like really comes across from you. And of all of the HR issues that you could pick, why focus on working mothers for your new venture, which is WOMA? Well, women are underrepresented in the workplace and have been for a very long time. And we have, well, they always have been. And we have made inroads, most definitely. And there's been developments of women in the workplace. But we know we still have a gender pay gap. Women are paid 81 cents to every dollar globally versus men. Not good enough. We know that the pandemic has been catastrophic when it comes to the impact on women. Um, the Harvard Business Review wrote a paper and explained that they believe we've gone back over 10 years when it comes to developments of women in the workplace. We've got some really big problems in terms of how we see women and support women at work. More women graduate from university than men. And yet at the top of the triangle in the senior positions, we have more men. So there's been a personal element to that through my career where I've certainly felt like I've had to fight my way to be heard sometimes as a woman and so there's been the personal impact of raising three children and having a career and being passionate about it and then by the very nature of my career I have managed hundreds of maternity leaves across my career and I've seen brilliant incredible amazing women have bad experiences from the behavior of a line manager or drop out of the workplace or feel they can't do it. And that's absolutely fine. There's no judgment on that. If a woman chooses to step into being a mother than rather than having her job, it's a personal choice. But what can organizations be doing to make the whole experience more positive, more engaging, more va valuable, more connected for the woman? And I think we have a gaping hole in terms of the resources that are available to women in the workplace and to HR departments to make it better. And if you look at digital solutions, tech solutions for inclusion, what are they? There's very little being done in this space. And I felt that it was time to do something about it. So two years ago, I stepped out of my corporate career to build WOMO. And WOMO is just the first bit. You know, we're doing men a menopause module, fertility, paternity. So a much bigger vision and mission of saying women are underrepresented. We want to support women as an underrepresented group and have a real solution for inclusion in the workplace for women. I want to go back to the working mothers because as a headhunter, I mean, I speak to people all the time and I remember very, very early in my career, I was doing this big, big project of literally mapping out all of the buyers and merchandisers in the UK at sort of senior manager to head of buying. And I remember looking at all the stats and at any one point in time, and this was a very, you know, long project, that it was a third of women, it was predominantly women in those roles that were on maternity leave. And that's a huge, you know, that's a huge number, but also, which also means that this is the pivotal moment for, to make that leap to the director level. And if there are very few women to choose from, and you know, they're on maternity leave, it's very, very difficult. So my question is, I mean, you're talking about it being a personal choice and I completely agree with you on that, but what are the reasons that women don't return back into the workplace? Because sure, if you don't want to, that's fine, personal choice. But I don't think that's the main reason why women don't return. What do you think that is? Well, a biggie is the cost of childcare. 
The cost of childcare in this country is insane. And it is in other markets. You know, that you've, there's reports written about it that really make it very, very hard. And so there's a, there's a shift or a balance that takes place at that point of, is what I'm earning enough to help me get back into the workplace? So the cost of childcare is absolutely mind blowing. And I think a lot of women weigh up the financial implications of that. And if they are a two parent family, discuss it together. And typically it's the woman that will step out to take the role of looking after the children. That's one thing. Now that's outside of our control in terms of the organization. But what we can be doing as a business is looking at gender um, pay parity because maybe that woman is earning a bit less than she would otherwise if she was a man. So that should be something we're looking at for companies to really be clear on the pay rates they are giving to women. I also think that during maternity leave, many women report having a big loss of confidence, their purpose and their identity of who they were before that baby arrives naturally is thrown up on in the air and you know really finding who you are in that as a mum when you've never had this baby in your life before is a big emotional shift and if then your workplace has forgotten about you or you perceive they've forgotten about you because you don't receive any communication or there's no contact or you've forgotten what it's like to be doing that job every day because you're busy with nappies and feeding and inside you have a real confidence crash. And we hear about this a lot from women. So my view, I strongly feel the organization have a responsibility to keep that woman engaged and have her feel valued and wanted and connected to the job she had before. Because by having a baby, arguably, Mm -hmm. we know that women can be more organized and more on it. And actually there's a client we work with who says, I always want to employ a working mother because they juggle so much, they're more on it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So how do we value the skills that come with that of being able to juggle children and a job and home life and everything else that comes with it? And I think companies can do a better job of supporting women through that. So I think that's another reason why women drop out of the workforce. Mm. They feel fearful about coming back. I totally, I mean, I have kids myself and I totally see this when you when you are having kids and before having kids i never even used to think about gender you know bias or anything like that and it's only since then i was like oh that's what it's all about this is how you really are affected i mean i won't go into too much detail about that but the point i'm trying to make is that this idea of you know losing the confidence in the isolation and i think like raising kids i think we've kind of all got it backwards to some extent because you know staying like the whole concept of like stay at home mum being by your Yourself in the house and kind of handling all of that responsibility and just being really isolated from everything that you used to know. And I feel like, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think, you know, we have to some extent forgotten a little bit about the fact that we need to be including everyone in in that and organizations governments you know communities do have a role to play and making sure that that doesn't happen. But going back to what the employers can be doing because on the one hand communicating with you know um a female employee who's on maternity leave on the one hand it's okay you want to stay engaged but on the other it's like well do they need to have their own privacy and be left alone to do that it's like it's a fine balance it is how you engage that so what's the right way of doing that well through our tech when they subscribe onto the platform we ask the expecting parent so we say how often would you like to be contacted? And we ask the question. And that's another part of what we empower through WOMO is own your journey. Mm -hmm. This is your maternity. You're the one having the baby. What do you want? And I think it sounds so basic, but just being able to ask those questions up front Mm -hmm. allows her to feel empowered and it allows the organization to get that information up front and then manage it accordingly. And if during your maternity leave, you've asked to be contacted monthly, and then you think, no, actually, I want no contact, you can change it in your settings through our tech immediately and mm. make a change, and then HR are alerted. Um, so we give the flexibility, but it's asking that mother at the beginning. Mm. I think it's just being heard, isn't it? Yeah. It's like your opinion matters rather than you're just sort of dealt with what you're given Mm. rather than saying, well, this is how I want to be supported and this is what's going to take. Mm -mm. In terms of you being as a business owner and obviously, you know, getting your amazing platform off the ground, what has been the biggest challenge for you? 
Well, (laughs) (laughs) so many. (laughs) Mm, Where do you start? Where do I start? Well, the first challenge Mm -hmm. is I made the choice to come out of corporate life in November of 2019. And I resigned and I was on a four month notice period. And a quick calculation of the maths will tell you that I then finished my notice as we went into lockdown one. Mm. So I resigned before COVID was a word and and then seemed to land into my new future entrepreneur career <laughs> at the start of a global pandemic. <laughs> Great timing. Well done. Um, and at the time I was thinking, mm. oh my word, what have I done? This mm. is like a nightmare. Um, And then I had all the three kids at home, one doing A-levels, one doing GCSEs, one in reception. And I was thinking, this is horrendous. So (laughs) that was a huge challenge. But interestingly, I look back now and it was divinely timed because I was able to juggle it all. Whereas had I been still doing my corporate stuff, I think the kids would have been a lot more neglected. Um, And I'm a solo parent, so it's me with them at home. Um, And... So that was the first big challenge. The next big challenge for me is everything takes longer than I wanted to take. And I find that very frustrating. So we started to build the tech. We started to map out the customer journey and I would work with our tech build business and say, I want this, this, and this. And then a week later I'd say, have you done it? And they'd say, well, we just work. And I'd be, I want it. I need it now. I want it. (laughs) Um, And so I had a, a, a misconception of how long this was all going to take. So my runway of when I expected my product to be out and live and happening and beta testing finished and was all taken longer than I thought. Um, But that's probably about the the pace I like to work as a person (laughs) and my frustrations of making things happen because I want everything now. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we went live last July And I think my next big challenge was underestimating the sales cycle of selling an HR product into HR. Having sat in that seat for 25 years, I had a a different perception of how it might be received by some HR leaders and their decision-making powers. And I think that coupled with the worst two years of HR's life in terms of furloughing, hybrid working, the redundancies, HR are really overwhelmed and they're coming out of that now. And we're beginning to see a real, a quickening and an uptake on our client recruitment um, of bringing customers onto the tech. But I think that was another really big challenge. I under, underestimated how broken HR have been well, from the last two years. They're kind of carrying all of the issues. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I was reading a recent stat and it was, what, 43% of individuals don't rate career as the most important thing for them now. So the the idea that career should be the most important thing in your life is really kind of you know mm. beginning to sort of dissipate as a result of the pandemic. It may change, but with employers and HR in particular having to deal with every single issue from figuring out furloughs, as you said, to where people are going to work from. How do you, you know, create those, you know, bonds, the teams, and then the legal aspects, the well-being, the everything. I mean, it's it's a lot. I have to say, like, whenever I speak to my <laughs> my clients who are HR, and I just say, I take my hat off for you for basically just like keeping going and for not collapsing and for, you know, trying to make it better because mm. it's it's a lot. It's a lot on that function to be able to deal with it, with it all. It's massive. And I am, um, there's no roadmap. There's no answer. There's mm-hmm. no rule book. Mm-hmm. Hybrid working. What does that even mean? Every co- every company is doing it differently. There's no one size fits all. So they're navigating, rebuilding the culture of a business with half the business, not there half the time. You know, it's a very challenging time mm-hmm. with no obvious answers. Mm-hmm. So it's finding your way every day. Mm. Um, they've got a lot on their desk. Yeah, I know for sure. Going back to your business and the challenges, you're raising funds right now. What is that like? Oh my gosh. (laughs) Oh my God, it's brutal. It is really, really brutal. Um, And I feel particularly ranty about this subject. (laughs) I went to this amazing event, um, funding focus event at the London Stock Exchange about three weeks ago. Um, And I'm raising uh, 1.5 million through our seed round. And at this particular event, um, 
David Horn was presenting and uh, he shared that 1% of VC funding goes to female founders. And I mean, I know it's hard, but I felt really kicked in the teeth. And the year before was 2.4%. Mm-hmm. So it's it's Massive worse, drop. it's got this huge drop. Yeah. And you yeah. think, why? You know, what's really going on there that female founders are having such a challenging time? If you have a co-founder who's a man, it's 14%, and the other 85% goes to male founders or teams of male founders. Mm-hmm. 85%. You just think this is an insane bias mm-hmm. and really challenging. And I feel very cross about it, mm-hmm. um, particularly as I am in this position of raising this money. And I think the whole funding world needs to just rethink this bias against women. Um, and there's some amazing funds out there that are supporting women and men, like this chap, David Horn, who are really championing women. Um, and I heard this great word the other day from a friend of mine about man ambassadors. We need man ambassadors, you know, men that are going to really champion women because men tend to listen to men. So if a man says to another man, invest in Elizabeth, invest in Womo, this idea is brilliant. He's more likely to pay attention to that. So I think for women, as frustrating as it is, it's getting those man ambassadors on side, getting those champions who can really shout about what women are doing. I don't like it, but it's the reality of what I think we need to be doing to get funding in. Well, until there is true representation in terms of having enough women investors on the scene, mm-hmm. then you do need that because, yeah. you know, if, if 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 there's not enough women who are investing in other women, then you need to kind of break that intellectually and mm. saying, well, actually, we do need more men on board to be mm. able to be these man bastards or yeah. as they're called. So I totally see the need. And what you, what you were saying about the... The pandemic and the fact that there are even less female founders being funded currently. Why do you think that is? It's a good question. Why is there a drop? Like, what's causing that? Some of the um, stuff that was shared this particular event I went to is around by bi- unconscious, well, conscious or unconscious mm-hmm. bias, but some biases around women. Um, and there is a um, belief by many people that they unconsciously or consciously, I don't want to say. <laughs> consciously, because it feels like I'm being quite aggressive about it. But actually, is it that men just believe that men lead businesses? And so unconsciously, they invest in men because they think they are natural leaders and they're used to men leading businesses. I don't know. I don't have the stats you know, behind that bias, but it is believed that is the case. So men buy into men. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact it's dropped during the pandemic for me is, I believe, a fear, and this is just my belief, but a fear around the fact that the pandemic has been impacted on global markets, on how businesses have performed. And so people go into their comfort zone, into their safety zone. And if we've got men who are investing in men, is there an unconscious bias to safety of, well, if I invest in this man, he's a man, he's gonna drive that business. And I I presume it's unconscious, but Mm. I have a sense that people have gone into a safety mode Mm. of where they feel more comfortable potentially putting their funds. But that's just a belief I have. I haven't got any backup on that. (laughs) No, I I think you're right. And I think when we're faced with uncertainty and when fear comes to play, it's almost like people go in polar opposites. So it's either the, okay, this is the moment for opportunity, the risk takers, like let's do something completely different that's never been done before. And to some extent that's being done by people who probably have very little to lose to some extent. So, you know, it, whatever the risk you take, you're probably more risky to not do it rather mm. than to do it. And then on the other polar opposite is, well, we just need to preserve the status quo as much as possible, do things that we've always done and just sort of stick with that. And it just seems like that's the case with mm. with investors. I mean, I was asked a question by a VC um, through this process, a VC who I had one meeting with and it and you know it didn't progress. And this particular man said to me, That's great you're doing this. This is amazing. How are you juggling being an entrepreneur with the kids? And I was like, I cannot believe I've just been asked that question. Mm. Because there's no way in a million years a man would have been asked that question. Never. And so from that very first meeting with this particular VC, there was a bias before I had even got into any further stages with that. Before you've even opened your yeah. mouth and spoken. Yeah. yeah. And he meant it in a nice way. He was mm. complimenting me saying, how do you juggle it? But the bias was blatant to me because no man, no male founder would ever have been asked that question. Mm. So there was a presumption that I'm juggling kids and being an entrepreneur, which 
you could say to him with that lens means I'm more high risk to him as an investor. Mm -hmm. It's the expectation that you're the one who's going to be doing that. And, you know, how are you handling that? It's almost like this implied, well, isn't it so difficult to do that? And, yeah, um, yeah I mean, there's all sorts of issues at play. I mean, one, the unconscious bias. Two, the fact that their expectation is on the women to be handling not the, just the household tasks, the childcare mm -hmm. and everything else that's unpaid. And I wonder if part of that is also to do with I don't know if there's fewer women taking the chances to go out and start companies because they do have so much on their plates. So to some extent, I feel your anger towards being asked that question. But at the same time, I feel like we need to go deeper into that question because like, why is it that women are in that position? Why is that the question being only addressed to women and not to men? It's like, well, how are you supporting your family during this yeah. time when there's very little childcare? For example... You know, that is something that could be asked to men very yeah. easily. What do you hope to achieve with WOMA? What's your, like your big picture vision? Like, what do you, what do you want to do? I want to be able to support women and retain them and engage them in the workplace. And that's my big mission is to say, women, we value you. We want you to remain in this business, in your careers, you know, whether it's not for that company, but just to feel valued so you can progress your career. And if you take a career break to have kids or even to take four or five years off, let's stop this judgment on people coming back in. That's another big part. It's not what we do at Womo, but I think the returnship piece for me is really valuable mm. of rather than writing women off because they've had kids, we know that actually that in itself is a whole skill set that you can bring into the workplace alongside what might have been your career before. Mm -hmm. But back to your question. My big vision for WOMO is about us being able to support women in the workplace. So WOMO, as in Working Mother, is our first module, which is supporting women from the moment they say they're pregnant, from being pregnant at work, being on mat leave, preparing to return, then being back at work. We then launch our menopause module back end of this year, and then fertility and paternity next year. So what we're really saying is, we recognize that women go through all these different things in their life. And rather than put it under the carpet and not mention it, you know, let's talk about it. My first two children are IVF babies. I'm very open about it. And through that process, and this is nearly 20 years ago, I never told my employer. I lied about why I was wet late when I was going to the clinic. I was all over the shop emotionally and frantically stressed and under pressure of trying to juggle my job and go through IVF and injections and dan dans. And I told no one. Now, maybe you don't want to tell your employer and that's okay. But if we can give resource and content that women can access confidentially through their benefits portal at work or however that particular company offers it, why wouldn't we want to do that and give them tools and tips on maintaining their, you know, calm, minimizing stress, how to have a conversation with your HR if you so choose to share that, what type of support you can get mm -hmm. through going through a fertility process. And that's just one example of the bigger picture of all these things that women are typically juggling and keeping under wraps because they're too fearful of being too emotional, too volatile, too ballsy. You know, we hear mm -hmm. stories about women being um, told off for being, you know, God, what's wrong with her? Bloody women. You know, these types of attitudes that you hear about in the workplace. Whereas if a man's all ballsy or a bit emotional or a bit full on, you don't get the same response. Mm -hmm. So how can we make women's journeys through all those things in life normalized and accepted and welcomed and understood in the workplace to bring them to the forefront of the board table, which for me would be the dream. Mm. You know, I'd love to think that there could be a board meeting going on and they say, Elizabeth's not here today. Really exciting. She's going through fertility treatment. She's out today, but back in next week. And for everyone to say, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Not, oh my gosh, why isn't she here? That's outrageous. Mm. You know, I want to normalize all the human things that we go through in life as mm. women.
It just makes me really sad where you can't share that you are either getting pregnant or you were pregnant and now you're going through a miscarriage. And we're talking about being emotional. Of course, you're going to be emotional, especially if you're holding all of that in and you can't share it because not only are you carrying that with you, but also the expectation of the judgment on you for those things and being so isolated for me is the number one issue. Mm. And what you're saying about being able to share and saying, yeah, Actually, I think just by sharing it and just by providing even that emotional support already makes it that much easier, which makes your burden as a woman going through that much less, which means that you do have spare energy and extra energy to continue going mm. down, you know, handling the meetings or, you know, continuing down that career. It becomes less things to carry on your own, mm. uh, which shouldn't even be on your own because it's not to do with you a lot of the times either. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I just feel really strongly about that of women just carrying too much. Mm. And, and this all plays into the well-being agenda that companies now have on their desk too. Um, and of course, the diversity and inclusion agenda. It's, you know, we really have to keep working to be able to invite employees to be their authentic self and be truly who they are and bring all of them to the workplace. And through a lot of well-being, um, you know, I mean, as you know, just for the listeners, you know, my role when I left Tapestry, part of my role was heading up well-being for the company and being able to create safe spaces where people can come together. And it could be an art workshop or we did a kombucha workshop once. Um, <laughs> you know, we did different things. And you might say, well, how is that well-being? Well, it's well-being because you get people off their desk for 45 minutes or an hour. They sit and talk to people from other departments. Great cross-collaboration in terms of communication. And they get to talk about other things. And when you bring people together and they can have a laugh over making kombucha, then they are learning something, they're talking together and they're opening up. And this is where authenticity can really come into play in the workplace. These tiny moments of connection where people can be more open and honest. And when you invite them to do it in a much less obvious way by coming to a wellbeing session, you begin to have people open up and be who they are. It's the idea of psychological safety, isn't totally. it? Totally. Where yeah. you feel that you can be yourself, you can share, that you're not going to be judged. Yeah. And that makes businesses so much more productive. Yeah. When you don't have to watch your back, where you don't have to pretend that you're, you know, well, because especially if you're a customer facing business, how you treat your employees is going to be directly impacting on how your customers are going to be treated. Yeah. And that's absolutely going to be impacting how well your business does. Mm. And at the end of the day, it's all to do with people. So surely we need to learn better ways of how to deal with them. I know. And it's amazing how often that doesn't happen. I know. It's funny you should say that. I, I've always, <laughs> I used to say this a lot. My old team will remember this, that I used to say, Every employee is a walking PR machine mm -hmm. and you want them sat in the pub on a Friday night mm -hmm. saying, do you know what my company did this mm -hmm. week? It was so cool. We did this, this, and this. You don't want them saying my company are awful and they mm -hmm. treated me badly and they were rude and they disrespected me because of this, this, and this. Remember, everybody who works for you is talking about you. How much easier it would be to hire? Like you're just having like walking, talking PR machines. Yeah. Just anybody will want to come and join you and put me out of business. So <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, True. So. With regards to what leaders can do to, I suppose, to help you on your mission, what would you like to see happen? Authentic leaders. And what I mean by that is when leaders can be authentically in themselves and share authentically, they invite others to do the same. Um, and a very real true story that demonstrates this is a particular leader that I worked with that had a personal mental health challenge and was out of the business for a short time. And when he returned to the workplace, he said, I don't want anyone to know. And I said, I invite you to tell your team. Because if you can do that, you are truly stepping into your authentic self and you will invite the same from your people. Mm -hmm. And he did tell them, and it was so powerful in how they responded in supporting him and opening up and saying, you know, that happened to me or my brother or my mom and were much more open. So I invite leaders to try and overcome that fear of holding things in and being authentic because by doing it, you invite it in others. 
You know, your perception is your projection. If you can project out authenticity, you'll get it back. And I think that's really powerful. Um, and also for leaders, I invite leaders to really be open to the differences in people from a diversity and inclusion perspective. Not everybody is the same as you. Everybody is totally different. And you might not understand the struggles someone else is going through, but it's their struggle. And if you can keep an open mind and actively listen and pay attention and take a moment from the busy like email craziness to sit with that person, you can really help them. And I think this is even more apparent when you look at a male female dynamic. Mm -hmm. So men might understand some of men's struggles, but a man isn't gonna understand necessarily what a woman's going through if she's had a miscarriage or been through something awful. But to actively listen, use your empathy, be present and ask that person what they want. What do you need right now? What is it I can do to make this better for you? How can I help you through this journey? and ask really open questions to be able to support that person. Mm. I think when leaders can do that, it's incredibly powerful. It's not kind of amazing what you can do when you can accept that you are not perfect. Yes. Yes. And Perfection doesn't exist, right? It doesn't exist. And I say it shouldn't exist because, mm. you know, we, we're all allowed to have off moments. Like we wouldn't be human if that wasn't the case. And to have the pressure of constantly making the right move all the time isn't the right thing either because it's through making mistakes that we actually learn something yeah. or not even making mistakes, but trying something different, something new, which has the risk of it not going to how you anticipated. And sometimes it's exactly what you need to do to see a completely different perspective. So my question to you, I mean, has there been a mistake or an error that you've done that made you change the way you see something? Or if you hadn't have made it, you know, where you are today wouldn't have happened in the best possible way? Mm. I'm not a perfectionist <laughs> is the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a very hands-off leader. So if one of the team make a mistake, I see a mistake as a learning and I'll try not to come down hard on that person. Um, I've equally worked for a person who is a perfectionist mm. <laughs> and who micromanaged me and I found it horrific. Mm -hmm. um, I have certainly made mistakes. I've really, I've made big mistakes. You know, I've sent... Um, <laughs> the wrong email to the wrong person, some, once with some really confidential information in it um, by accident. Um, we make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And most people, when they make a big mistake, feel absolutely horrendous about it. They feel guilt and they're cross with themselves and their inner critic is in full flow. Um, what they don't need then is a leader saying, you're rubbish and you messed it up and that was terrible. Um, so I think pivotal moments where I've made a mistake. Yeah. I mean, I've made them. And I think managing my own emotions for me is my biggest learning in that because mm. I can really be tough on myself when I make a mistake mm -hmm. and I'm really mad at myself and mm -hmm. it can take me days to get over it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel you. I'm yeah. very much the same. And just recognizing that's happening sometimes takes a while mm. because before I didn't even realize that that was going on because it's not conversation that you have with words in your head. And when you start to put words onto it, then actually you can begin to spot it. But it's taking me, I mean, I'm going to be 40 this year and it's only just beginning to actually, ah, okay, this is the trigger and this is what's going on. And yeah, it's, it's hard when, mm. you know, when we're being tough on ourselves, which means that also we can be tough on others too. Mm. And until we have that self-compassion for ourselves and having that self-awareness to recognize it and to be mm. like, it's okay that we can, it starts to kind of permeate and we change the world to some extent. With no, other totally. People, so. And I'll give you an example. Literally this week, I sent an email to an investor, a brand new investor um, who had been referred to me by somebody and I misspelt the name of the investor mm -hmm. and I click send. And I, as I click send in my head, I, caught it it's like oh, i didn't check that spelling it used to be like this undo button instantly yeah, it's like oh my god oh my god the email's gone oh my god oh my god yeah and i was absolutely mortified and then i catastrophized the entire thing mm -hmm. they're never going to invest mm -hmm. i've screwed it up this is a disaster i look like i have poor attention to detail they're not going to 
believe Womo is any good. And mm-hmm. before I knew it, my entire company was a disaster mm-hmm. because I'd made mm-hmm. one mistake mm-hmm. on an email. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, I had to calm myself down and realize that, yes, we make mistakes. Um, but I felt terrible, terrible. Mm-hmm. I wonder if if you have a very creative mind and wild imagination, which is extremely positive and very necessary to when you're starting a business, then if you can imagine the best, you can also imagine the worst yeah, that's true. in very yeah. creative ways. So it's like a double-edged sword. You have to find the other side of it. Like how does it play out in different situations? And yeah, I feel like we're always balancing polar opposites. Yeah. And Going back to your own personal experience, would you do anything differently now that you've had your career in HR, you've started your business and looking back, is there anything you would change? No. And that's more about a bigger belief system that I have. I have a slightly esoteric, esoteric, um, hippie belief system that this is my journey and everything I've learned, even when it's gone horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. And there's been some disasters along the way in my life that you could look back and say god that was awful i learned from it i grew from it and i'm grateful for everything even the bad stuff that happened maybe not when i'm deeply in it but i can look back and think i'm happy that happened you know i'm grateful because it's given me a strength or a skill or an understanding or an appreciation or an empathy for others in that particular situation um so now I have a strong belief this this was my journey and mm. I'm meant to be on it. What advice would you give your younger self? Um, that's a good question. What advice would I give my younger self? Believe in yourself. You know, when I look back to my 20s, I had so little confidence. So, I mean, I constantly thought I was rubbish at everything. And I look back now and that think... That is so hard to believe. Like knowing <laughs> you as I do now, I just... Yeah, I don't see that at all. I really, people who knew me then Mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have said that Mm -hmm. because I was confident and ballsy and, Mm. but underneath. What you feel like inside is Yeah, underneath I was constantly worrying and a bit anxious and, oh God, have I done it all wrong? And I'd say to my younger self, you've got this. It's going to be okay. Just go with it. Be in flow. You know, just be, be on the journey. Um... And I think being in flow and just being in the moment is the advice I would give to my younger self of just let what comes come and Mm. just appreciate the journey because I didn't believe in myself. I was really tough on myself. And I think that lack of confidence can be um, really tough to live with Mm -hmm. for young kids. I've got Mm. teenagers, they're 19 and 17 and I, daughters, and I see the worries and the anxiety that they deal with day to day well, that's a whole social social media rant, actually. But um, I it's think so amplified now. It's really amplified with mm-hmm. social media, and I think it's incredibly challenging. I'm grateful I didn't have that when I was their age. <laughs> it's like already hard with social comparison against everyone you go yeah. to school with, and now the whole world is your classroom. Yeah, it's and really that's tough. Really hard. Yeah, I think so. Mm. I just had a question, lost it in my head. <laughs> Don't worry. Every, every every time I have something and it's like, God, thank God it's like not live. Oh, yes, the flow. You were talking about the flow. Yeah. You said about being in the flow more often. Mm. What gets you in that state? I have to consciously pull it back now into now. So, and this is a technique that I use to manage my own, you know, anxiety moments when I'm really anxious or when I'm super stressed. A lot of the time when I'm very stressed, I'm stressed by this hasn't happened and then I've got to do this and then that's going to happen and I can feel myself, you know, my breath quickens, I can't get enough air in my lungs and I'm, you know, a bit panicky about I'm not going to get through it or I won't get it done or I'm going to fail on this or whatever it might be. And a technique I use is to come back into now. What can I do in the next five minutes that's gonna shift the dial. What action can I take now? Because the time spent being in a flap about it is getting me precisely nowhere. And if I can come back into an actionable moment of what I can do in that day and how I feel in that moment, I can let go of the panic of what's coming. Um, And I find that really helpful. And that's part of what being in flow means to me is come back to now, come back to today. today. 
you know, 10 minutes ago is gone and we're not at tomorrow yet. Mm -hmm. So what we have right now is now. And if we can come back to now, we can make decisions in this moment that can shift the dial to make things better and to be on the path of where we need to go. It's also taking things that you can control into your hands, yes. isn't it? Because when we get into that state of anxiety and thinking about, well, this could do this and could do that. And it's like, it's not even happening yet. It's mm -hmm. just in your imagination. It's like, what can you do in the here and now that actually in your control mm. and to get into the doing rather than the kind of like the anxious thinking. Mm. I'm going to remember that. I think that's a really good tip. And although sometimes like, you know, these things, putting them into practice can be really, really mm. challenging. I'm going to put a note <laughs> on The my... other one to remember is acceptance, is that mm. it is what it is right here, right now. Mm -hmm. And just accept and let go of control because it mm. is. You might not like it and it might not be the way you wanted it to go, mm -hmm. which happens to us all, all the time. But if we can accept and go, but it is. Mm -hmm. then we can let go of that control uh, feeling, you mm -hmm. know, that can come up inside. Yeah, if we can all learn to do that, then just life will just be so much easier and in flow. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I, but mm -hmm. I mean, I say that and that's techniques I use. I certainly, because we're human, have days when I'm in a panic and rushing too fast and everything's heightened and that sense of, ah, mm -hmm. is going on. Mm -hmm. We all do it. And my last question is, what seems impossible to you now that should you achieve it will change the course of your life or your business? That is a big question. <laughs> what feels impossible to me now other than raising 1.5 million? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, that is possible and it mm -hmm. is going to happen and we are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, what feels impossible to me now? I think... I mean, nothing feels impossible because impossible is such a horrible word, but um, I feel like getting Womo and to where I want it to be with these new modules and getting it all launched and getting it in companies, that feels impossible sometimes. Mm -hmm. I believe every company will benefit from our platform and I want to tell every single person about that right now. Mm -hmm. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, it's impossible to get the message out there at the speed that I want. That feels impossible. Um, so I think, yeah, that feels impossible. It feels impossible to get the message where I want it to be to support women in the workplace. And I feel like it's insurmountable to get this change and mind shift away from this negativity towards, um, maybe negativity is the wrong word, but this um, bias towards the contribution women can make in the workplace, that feels impossible. Um, and the second part of your question is, what can I do about it? Was that right? That will change the course of your life or business. I think just keeping the belief. And in those dark moments when it does feel impossible and you feel like you can't do it, it's just keeping the belief. You know, I totally believe in what we're doing. I totally believe in the project. I totally believe in my company or I wouldn't be doing it. Um, and I think holding that belief when it feels impossible is what keeps the energy and keeps the drive and keeps the team going and keeps us moving forward. Um, yeah. So coming back to belief that we can do this. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming onto the show. What's the best way to find you? So our website is womonetwork.com, which is our community for all working mothers everywhere. It is open to anybody. Um, and you can contact us there or me, uh, Elizabeth at womonetwork.com. Um, and then our tech platform, there's a, a nod to it on our website, but to learn more about our tech platform, drop me a message or find me on LinkedIn and we can give you a demo of the platform and how the tech can really transform how you support women in your business. Um, and we love showing the platform to companies. So please don't be afraid to come and ask us. We love doing tech demos. Um, and we can bring it to life for you and show you how it works. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and I'll see you next week.